Hello there, and welcome to this, the second video delving into the special topics of pre and perinatal health and psychology. I'm your host, Dr. Alyssa Shepard, holistic pregnancy and birth coach and creator of the online birth bliss course for holistic childbirth preparation. If this is your first time tuning in, it's wonderful to be able to share this vital information with you. And I would encourage you to go back and watch my first video so that you have a strong foundation on pre and perinatal health and psychology. If this isn't your first time tuning in, I'm excited you're back to learn more about this ever fascinating and rich topic that is the period of our earliest experiences. First, do no harm. These are commonly used words in medical circles and a central tenet of many healthcare disciplines, ranging from allopathic North American style medicine to the many branches of alternative healthcare and alternative medicine. But what does this actually mean? First, do no harm. Harm to whom or what? How does one arrive at the decision of what best upholds this tenet for all involved? These are the often muddy waters and gray areas comprising what is known as ethics, an ethical decision-making and practice, which is filled with even more shades of gray when one examines how ethics is practiced and upheld inside the special periods of pregnancy, birth, and infancy. It is this topic we will examine together in this video, the special difficulty in ethical-based practice that presents within the prenatal and perinatal periods, including birth, and why an approach respecting and incorporating pre- and perinatal psychology is critical to not only first doing no harm, but also of facilitating healing on a profound core level for each of us as individuals and also collectively as a society. But before we dive in though, I want to equip you with a method to use as a resource if you find any of this content overwhelming or start feeling yourself slip into stress or distress, if you feel your physiology or mind start to wind up in fight or flight, or start feeling yourself falling down into the lower energy state of freeze. The technique comes from the work of the late Ray Castellino, a chiropractor, cranial sacral therapist, and pre and perinatal educator and advocate. Ray Castellino uses this as one of his seven essential pillars when running healing interventions called womb surrounds. The technique is the technique of pause, which is to say it is the technique of taking a temporary break for however long you need. In this pause, you can connect with your breath, connect with the environment you are currently in, and connect with the fact that you are here, now, in this moment, and not in some past moment in time. If you need a pause, I'll encourage you to pause the video and then to do what you need to do in terms of self-care. And in doing so, bring greater regulation to your nervous system. One of the challenges with presenting material about the prenatal and perinatal periods, as well as birth, is that we've all been through these experiences, wherein we had the potential to encounter many unique moments of beauty and bliss, as well as challenge and possibly even violence or trauma. Our preverbal memories are stored in our implicit memory, which as we discussed in the previous video, is found in our subconscious mind, as well as in the somatic tissues in our body. A mere discussion of topics stored in our implicit memory can be enough to trigger and activate these, even without conscious knowledge of the triggering event. So I'm going to encourage you to remain aware of your state and conscious of your needs for a pause. Diving in then, perhaps the most obvious and paradoxically least obvious challenge to ethical-based practices in the prenatal and perinatal period is the unique challenge wherein care for one directly affects care for another. Mother and baby are inseparable during pregnancy and birth and ideally retain a degree of that connection and inseparability in the period after birth leading through that first year of infancy. Generally speaking, what one experiences will impact and affect the other and both mother and child are having an experience. It is far easier to identify with the wants and needs of the mother, partially because this is the person that's visible to the naked eye without technological interventions such as ultrasound, and also the one who possesses language, typically that's understandable to the healthcare provider, to assert their needs, their wants, and their values. However, the number of women who report dissatisfying birth experiences and the current epidemic of birth trauma, wherein one out of every three birthing women emerges from birth traumatized, speaks to the fact that visibility and audibility are not always protective factors where ethical conduct and decision-making is concerned. 
However, the birth trauma epidemic is a topic for a different video. Rather, where I'd like to explore more deeply in this video is the injustice that can come about for prenates and babies. Inside the study of ethics, justice is a special word that speaks to the moral rightness of some action or intervention based on factors including ethics, reason and rationality, and law. Conventional reason and scientific belief would assert that a prenate or infant is incapable of making choices and possessing free will. This notion is in stark contrast to emerging evidence wherein babies are found to change actions and behaviors in response to their environment, implying that babies are making decisions about what they do and how they do it in utero and showing preferences and choice. For example, when alcohol is consumed during pregnancy, there is evidence from ultrasound studies that prenates decrease the number of amniotic respirations. They breathe in and out less, presumably to take in less of the alcohol inside the amniotic fluid that cross the placenta. This meets an immediate need to avoid the alcohol as much as possible, but also gives less exercise to critical breathing muscles, potentially aligning these babies with more difficulty breathing after birth and even throughout life, from starting with weaker respiratory muscles. It would seem that babies prefer a uterine environment free of the influence of alcohol. Prenates continually show us the choices they make in the ways they move, when and how they practice sucking, or using their diaphragm, and in the choice multiples have in choosing to engage with one another or not. To this point, fraternal twins Luca and Alice have been reported to engage in caressing and affectionate behaviors visible on ultrasound as early as 20 weeks gestation. Where the law holds infants, much less prenates, as being in a state of incompetency and therefore incapable of making decisions, babies and prenates by legal definition have been set up to have the sacred right of being in possession and control of their personhood, free from interference of others or restraint violated. To be fair, there are times where intervention on behalf of a prenate or infant is essential and even life-saving and it would be incredibly unethical to withhold such necessary and life-saving interventions or procedures. However, many of the current obstetric and pediatric practices which are common today are rooted in policy and procedure of institutions. They serve to protect liability of the provider or institution rather than upholding what serves the greatest good of the individual, the family, or even society at large, even though the majority of care providers want to provide the best help that they can. Many of these practices did not occur before this century and remain unrecognized for the dramatic impact they may have in shaping a young being's experience, beliefs, and psychology. This brings an even greater challenge to ethical decision-making inside the prenatal and perinatal periods and can result in a lack of ethically made decisions. What could some of these practices be? I'll name a few, but would invite anyone who would like to explore and discuss this further to do so in the comments below. Many tests and procedures are now offered inside pregnancy which have the potential to cause the womb to feel less comfortable and less hospitable for the baby. When we move on to look at birth, these could include things as seemingly simple as being born into a colder room with harsh bright lights, or it could also include things such as amplified contractions from induced labor, or even a baby being slapped after birth to provoke the necessary cry for a complete APGAR score. Again, the comment section below is open for anyone who'd like to explore and discuss these practices or other practices more. One practice I'd like to touch on more deeply here is that of separating mother and newborn after birth. Separating mother and infant after birth is known to permanently alter the neurobiology of the rhesus monkey, with a tendency toward lifelong anxiety in these monkeys that were separated from their mother after birth for a mere four hours. Where humans and apes are 99% genetically the same, it only speaks to reason that separation of a human infant from the mother would similarly invite alterations in neurobiological development with possible long-term ramifications for the baby. Having said all of this, I'm now going to invite you to take a deep breath, reconnect with your current environment, and remind yourself that if as a parent you have had any of these interactions or interventions through choice or otherwise, either for yourself or your child, that we all do the best with what we know in the moment and that healing is always possible. In order to optimally shift this apparent imbalance, returning the scales to acts which are just and promote health and well-being 
in both the short and the long term, acts which not only merely do no harm, or at least the least harm, but acts that promote the greatest good for all, including the prenatal infant, it is imperative to integrate the knowledge gleaned from studies of prenatal and perinatal psychology. With this perspective in mind, we shift the very underpinnings of what we know and believe to be true about prenates and babies, leaving outdated beliefs and thoughts in the past, moving forward in an evidence-informed, compassionate manner. One such area of knowledge that desperately needs to be dispelled and rewritten is the notion that prenates and babies do not feel pain, that they cannot make sense of their pain and their experiences, that they're not having experiences, that they don't remember their experiences, and that they have no psyche. It is precisely these inaccurate, outdated beliefs which allow us to unwittingly enact violence and pain on our youngest and most vulnerable, while their very bodies, brains, and belief systems are forming. One can't help but entertain the question put forth by David Chamberlain as to whether we as a population are so fascinated with and drawn to drugs due to exposure at birth. An assertion strengthened by long-term correlations between the type and amount of anesthetics given at birth and later risk for drug addiction. So how do we do this? How do we make ethical decisions in the prenatal and perinatal and even postpartum periods? While there are numerous and varied approaches to the practice of ethics and ethical decision-making, it seems clear to me that we need to embody an approach individually and collectively, which places the needs, wants, feelings, and experiences of the baby whether they are in utero, being born, or somewhere in the year after birth, as equal to that of the care provider and higher than that of the institution. As a practical example, many women reach a point in pregnancy where they feel done with being pregnant and they just want their baby to be born. The question one encounters when thinking about a scheduled induction is, is baby ready to be born? This is the same question encountered when an institution or care provider wants to schedule an induction, for example, because baby has just dated beyond 40 weeks or 41 weeks or whatever number is favored by that practitioner or institution. Current science holds that the baby initiates labor. So if the baby was done with being in utero and ready to be born, the baby would initiate that process. A fair question to ask oneself is whether scheduled inductions are ethical and serve the best interests of the baby. This is a fair question to bring to the baby and to hear the baby's thoughts on, and this is something I teach women how to do in my online course Belly Bliss, The Art and Science of Bonding with Baby Before Birth. It can be incredibly useful to have a core set of values to turn to that can be used to help assess the ethical alignment and congruence of behaviors, interactions, procedures, or interventions. Also incredibly helpful is having clear steps to help both make ethically informed decisions and evidence-informed decisions, with one critical step being integration of the pause, or as it's phrased in the Lamaze system, stop and think. The term evidence-informed as a construct means that certain steps have occurred during the decision-making process. This model summarizes and encapsulates my approach to holistically making evidence-informed decisions. By necessity, the approach begins with finding a state of curiosity and asking questions. I like this system as it first encourages the asking of questions, and it is through asking questions which we learn, raise ourselves and those around us to greater heights and come to greater levels of awareness. Many of us have been taught not to question those we view to be in some sort of authority, and this is majorly to the detriment of ourselves as well as our children. It's important to remember that doctors may be an authority, but they are not in authority and that one can only know that which one knows. The act of questioning is a moral imperative where it comes to ethical and evidence-informed decision-making and actions. The second step of collect is to be open to any and all sources that one can think of to collect information from, which we'll discuss in a little more detail in a moment. Inside the step of collect, gathering information from multiple sources helps decrease the risk of confirmation bias which occurs when one only looks at information that will confirm their pre-existing thoughts and beliefs. Looking at multiple sources can help decrease the risk of engaging in confirmation bias, but does not eliminate it. It is important to be intentional about collecting information in an open-minded and objective fashion, and not merely to prove a pre-existing belief or thought. The last step, critique, is where one pulls all this information together 
and assesses its compatibility with their own values, helping one feel informed and able to arrive at working conclusions. These conclusions may inspire one to get curious again and ask more questions, requiring more information collection and then further critiquing, possibly multiple times. Ultimately, this process overall leads to feelings of empowerment, a vital element to health, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, according to the medical intuitive Carolyn Mace in her best-selling book, Anatomy of the Spirit. To flesh out step two, collect, with a bit more structure, these are the five layers which I encourage one to collect information from, starting first with the body, checking in with the implicit memory stored in your tissue and the intuition of your cells, noting any sensations, feelings, or knowings that arise. I like to encourage people to first check in with their body before any of the other sources to allow a more clear read of how their body responds without the overlay of thoughts from others or ideas in one's head. The next layer would be to connect with the prenatal or infant, a task which often stumps parents or caregivers as they attempt to connect with a baby they can't see or who doesn't have language in a way that they understand to communicate with. Such communication requires connection and trust, and this is something that I dive into deeply in my online course, Belly Bliss, The Art and Science of Bonding Before Birth. But briefly, when looking at what an infant has to share, one can take note of facial expressions, affect, body movements, vocalizations, and sounder intuitive knowings. Connection with the unborn child can feel trickier, asking one to be aware of changes in movement and rhythm, sensations in the body, or intuitive shares from the baby, which may come in the form of images, sounds, feelings, words, or even sentences. The next layer to check in with is your brain. This is one of the more comfortable areas for people, as this is where logic and reason can be accessed, as well as book knowledge and research. After this, it is appropriate to seek information from those whom one shares a bond with, personal or professional, which may mean family, friends, healthcare professionals, or various other individuals. Sometimes it is helpful to ask for direction from these sources for one's research, acknowledging that they may make biased recommendations based on their own belief systems and their own biases. Also inside this layer is the permission to let go and release any unsolicited advice which, for expecting parents or new parents, can abound and feel quite overwhelming. Lastly, there is a moral imperative to look from a broader vantage point. What can you see of others who have made this specific choice or decision? What is the apparent effect on the family, the community, the society, the world? When undertaken in an objective and open-minded fashion, this approach can bring great insight into what actually serves the greatest good not just for the one, but for all involved, and helps ensure that baby doesn't find themselves a passive passenger without having been consulted and given a voice and an ability to communicate choice and preference. This is a process which is empowering to babies and adults alike, and one which is beneficial to think through ahead of time, specifically where birth and the various interventions associated with birth are concerned. I want to leave you with a quote and to invite you to take a pause to really deeply reflect on this quote and its significance and meaning. As we live, we give birth. As we give birth, we live. These are words written by David Chamberlain, serving to remind us that babies are highly aware. Babies are sentient and can feel when they are being loved and respected, and they can also feel fear, pain, and violence. Babies remember their experiences from conception onwards, and sometimes even preconception. And these memories residing in implicit memory inform behavior, thoughts, beliefs, and feelings. Knowing this, it's optimal to stay in states of peace, comfort, love, and respect as much as possible, starting from conception, continuing through pregnancy, birth, and infancy, in order to truly transform our world and heal our planet. Granted, that isn't humanly possible, so the imperative becomes to be in communication with baby throughout these experiences. As our discussion of ethics and ethical decision-making in the pre and perinatal period closes, I wanna thank you for watching. If you liked this video or found it helpful, please share it with others who could benefit from this information. And please click the subscribe button so that you can catch new episodes as they're released. Should you want more information, you can reach out to connect with me through Instagram or comment below this video. Thanks again for watching.
Bye for now.